Hello, my name is Victoria Farrell, and I'd like to introduce you to some recipes for meatless Mediterranean cooking. At the end of the presentation, you'll find several pages with the full recipes for all of the dishes that we'll be exploring. The term Mediterranean encompasses a very large and diverse region, all countries bordering on the Mediterranean Sea. When Americans speak of Mediterranean cooking, they're generally meaning the cuisine of Italy, Greece, and perhaps Spain. In this presentation, we'll be focusing primarily on the type of Mediterranean food that I and many other Americans are most familiar with. Italian cuisine. When Americans think of Italian food, they immediately think of pizza or lasagna, foods filled with melted cheese, or large amounts of pasta and grand meatballs, and more pasta, cheese, meat, and bread. But in reality, Mediterranean cooking in Italy is very regional and has traditionally focused on making the most of seasonal vegetables. Vegetables not as vehicles for fried meats or large amounts of thick dressings, but vegetables as the stars themselves. Vegetables on their own can be both beautiful and delicious. This is a salad of young heirloom beets we grew last summer, roasted and dressed with just a small amount of chopped parsley and olive oil. This simple salad was a wonderful seasonal treat. Donna Leone, whose crime novels set in Venice are always filled with the wonderful meals that Commissario Brunetti enjoys at home with his family, observes Italian life is filled with food. She explains that food is not just something that appears at mealtime. Instead, much time is spent each day growing or shopping for it, talking about it, preparing it, and enjoying it with others. Many in America, for various reasons, have gotten away from that daily ongoing involvement with food and its pleasures. In 2005, the Silver Spoon Cookbook, the Italian equivalent of our Betty Crocker or Joy of Cooking cookbooks, was translated into English. Opening the book, one immediately discovers a different approach to cooking. Each two-page spread includes six recipes, rather than one recipe continuing for multiple pages. The recipes are uncomplicated ways of working with each vegetable or other ingredient. Reading it, you're reminded that cooking doesn't have to be complicated. Working with food can be enjoyable. The focus with much Mediterranean cooking is on enjoying vegetables in their prime season, simply prepared. It isn't about complicated processes or sauces, but rather about carefully balancing tastes and enhancing the natural flavors of quality vegetables. Today's presentation will provide an introduction to Mediterranean-style cooking by looking at some recipes and the techniques involved in making them. It might make sense to think for a minute about how one plans a meatless Mediterranean-style meal. Traditional menu planning usually begins with the centerpiece, a cut of meat, usually beef, ham or other pork, or chicken. One way to develop a vegetarian meal is to mimic a meat entree as your starting point. A portobello steak is a good example. This large mushroom has been broiled as one might broil a chicken breast and slice the same way. Its size and its meaty texture make it look like an entree. Much of how we feel about a food has to do with how it looks and assumptions we make about it based on its appearance. In addition to size, there are other ways a vegetarian dish can seem substantial enough to become an entree. It can be stuffed, it can be shaped into a loaf or layered, it can contain meaty vegetables like eggplant, and it can be combined with rice or pasta. I would also add that the more plant-based your eating becomes, the less you need to have one dish stand out as an entree. It slowly becomes satisfying to just have an assortment of what would be considered sides. 
Another way of planning a meatless meal is to envision the meal in the traditional way. In the left-hand photo, the red arrow points to the meat entree, chicken saltimbaca, which is chicken with sage and prosciutto. To make the meal vegetarian, you could plan the meal and then replace the chicken in, with roasted red peppers stuffed with eggplant, as I've done in the photo on the right. Any substitution needs to not only feel like an entree, but also work with the specific sides to make a satisfying meal. A meal needs contrasting and complementary tastes and textures. It's important to balance tastes. There are actually only five different tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory, also called umami. Umami, which is a product of amino acids in foods, was only identified as a taste in 1963. It's what makes a meal satisfying. When I plan meals, I think about one additional quality, and that is spicy. I like to balance that with the traditional taste. You might be thinking, but there's so many different tastes. How are there only five? We actually often confuse tastes and flavors. The five tastes are included through a variety of ingredients and flavors in different cuisines. If you want to include sour in a Mediterranean dish, you might use lemon, wine vinegar, or tomatoes. If you're making a Mexican or Latin American meal, you might choose lime or sour cream. For an Asian meal, you might use rice vinegar or pickled vegetables. So all cuisines are balancing the same taste, but using different ingredients and flavors to do so. The great thing is that this means that what you learn about balancing tastes in one cuisine will help you better work with them in other cuisines as well. Mediterranean cooking, because of its use of fewer ingredients, is one of the easiest cuisines with which to first explore balancing tastes. When I plan a meal, I try to include a variety of tastes. You don't want a meal with everything acidic. Instead, you want dishes that contrast and complement each other. And at least one dish should have umami for a satisfying meal. Because taste is so important, it's critical to taste your ingredients and dishes throughout the process. I'm embarrassed to say that there was a time when I served food I'd not tasted and used ingredients I'd never tasted on their own. Now I taste ingredients to become familiar with their tastes and flavors, and I taste fresh vegetables and fruits to know whether they're unusual in any way, so I can modify my recipe if needed. It's always best to taste often when you're cooking. There are ways you can adjust the taste if the balance isn't just right. You will note that the list begins with adding salt. Salt is critical for flavor. I do my best to avoid the sodium in canned and processed foods and use salt judiciously, but I do use it. Often adding just a little bit of salt will significantly change a dish. You will need to use less salt if you add it during the cooking rather than at the end. This list of corrective actions for imbalance is included with the recipes at the end of this presentation. When you make adjustments, do it very gradually. It's amazing the impact of just a small change. But all the adjustments of taste in the world won't help if quality ingredients aren't used. The simplicity of Mediterranean dishes makes the ingredients all the more important. This is a delicious salad that needs no recipe. It's just tomatoes, mozzarella cheese, fresh basil, and a drizzle of olive oil. But it only works with ripened summer tomatoes and fresh basil. So success really begins with growing or purchasing quality vegetables. Take the time to carefully select the freshest, most flavorful vegetables. If you're not able to grow all the vegetables you need, farmers markets and groceries also have quality produce. You might have come to the store planning to make a summer squash dish, but if what you find is squash like those on the left, that's probably not a good idea. If, on the other hand, you find squash like those on the right, you're set. 
Remember, when you're evaluating vegetables, stems are often a good indication of the freshness. Are they still green or are they shriveled and dried from age? I encourage you to also be inspired by great finds at the market. Especially with the possibility of researching online, you can almost always find a delicious dish for exceptional vegetables like these heirloom tomatoes, Tuscan kale, and zucchini. Cooking needs to be a strategy, not a formula. You want to make a delicious meal. It doesn't have to be a specific recipe. For Mediterranean cooking, it's great to have a basic pantry that will likely provide you with the other ingredients you need to make a new recipe based on your vegetable finds. The pantry list is included in the recipe section at the end. What your pantry does is provide a variety of tastes with Mediterranean flavors. There are additional items that are great to have. This list is also included with the recipes at the end of the presentation. Fresh herbs can add much to a dish. I find fresh basil and parsley essential to have on hand. I also grow rosemary and oregano for Mediterranean cooking. Remember, if you're substituting fresh for dried, you generally need to use at least twice as much, and it works best to add the fresh later in the cooking process. Remember that extra fresh herbs can be frozen. Just chop and close in aluminum foil and freeze in a freezer bag or container. Basil is the only herb that requires an extra step. It turns brown when frozen dry but you can food process it in some olive oil and then freeze it. I freeze it in mini muffin tins, remove the frozen basil cakes, and then return them to the freezer in a freezer bag. You can pull one out whenever you want to add basil to a dish. Let's use this pantry to make some versatile sides that include a variety of vegetables and tastes. Our first recipe is a very easy Greek-style salad. With each recipe, you will see a page number which refers to the page on which the recipe will be found in the end slides. This salad is a mix of vegetables such as cucumbers, various bell peppers, sweet onions, and tomatoes. You could also use other vegetables on hand. I cut the onion into a large dice. Tasting an onion before using it raw is really critical. Even sweet onions can carry quite a bite sometimes. If the onion is too strong, I put it in a bowl of ice water and let it rest until it has the right amount of bite. The longer the onion is in the ice water, the less bite it will have. Be sure you don't leave it so long that it loses all of its punch. Also, don't cut the dice smaller thinking it will be less oniony or have less bite. The more cutting is done, the stronger the flavor of the onion. Cut the other vegetables into a similar dice. In a salad like this, it's nice to have all the elements similar in size. I'm using a hothouse cucumber so the skin is not waxed. But I sampled the cucumber and the skin is a little tough. I want to retain some because it's nutritious, so I'm peeling it partially, which makes the skin work and also keeps the pieces attractive. I have the small tomatoes I'm using, using a serrated knife. Drain the onions and combine all. Next we make the dressing, which is very simple. Combine lemon zest, fresh oregano, and olive oil. I zest the lemon with a microplane. Juice the lemon. Be sure to buy lemons that have some softness so they'll be juicy. If you let them come to room temperature and then press down as you roll them on the counter a few times, they'll juice more easily. Cutting off the end will make them easier to juice on a juicer. I put everything in a jar, put the lid on, and shake. You can add other ingredients. I often sneak a little finely shredded raw kale and some cooked quinoa. Both add nutrition and the quinoa holds the dressing nicely so it clings better to the vegetables. I add quinoa to any dish I can as it's a complete protein, meaning it supplies all of the nine amino acids we need in our diets. Quinoa is easy to cook, 
Rinse it first, and then put one part of uncooked quinoa to two parts water in a pan. Bring it to a boil, cover, and simmer. It will absorb all the water. Let it cool, and then add it. If you're adding kale, wash it, remove the leaves from the spines, and then finely shred it. Add any of these extra ingredients, and then mix in the dressing. This can be a satisfying one-dish meal. We often serve the feta cheese on the side, so it's optional. The salad holds up really well refrigerated. Leftovers can be served as a side salad, even on lettuce leaves. I have included a recipe for another simple salad dressing at the end, one that uses olive oil, lemon juice, white wine vinegar, mustard, and honey. It can be used on this salad or any others. Be sure to taste it before using it. I often need to adjust the balance of tastes with salad dressings. Again, make any additions very gradual. This next salad is a very refreshing addition to a meal, asparagus and carrot julienne. This is a perfect example of a simple Italian recipe. It just includes carrots, asparagus, lemon, olive oil, salt, and pepper. I first prepare the asparagus by removing the tough stems. If you grasp the top of the spear in one hand and the bottom in the other and bend, the spear will break at the point where the stem becomes too tough to eat. The ends go in our compost pile. I try to cut the carrots to match the size of my asparagus pieces. If you can, avoid peeling the carrots. Many nutrients are just underneath the peel. Steam the asparagus and carrots separately, and then shock them in ice water to stop the cooking and help them retain their bright color. Be sure to steam the vegetables just the right amount of time. This is not a time to wander off. To test doneness, I slice a tiny bit off the end of a medium-sized spear and taste it to see if I like the texture. When the recipe is simple, each ingredient becomes very important. I like vegetables for salads to be tender enough to be easily eaten, but not too soft. If the spears differ dramatically in size, you can separate them by size and steam several batches. After shocking the vegetables, drain and dry them. Then make the dressing, which includes lemon zest and juice and olive oil. I'm using a measuring glass. It's a very handy tool when your ingredients are measured by teaspoons or tablespoons. You can measure all in the same glass, and I find it's much more accurate than filling multiple measuring spoons. You might wonder whether you should be using fresh or bottled lemon juice. With a dressing like this where lemon is the only flavor added, it's great to use fresh. And for this one, we're going to add the zest so we have to. That said, I always keep a bottle of lemon juice in the refrigerator and even use it in dressings. It can be hard to keep fresh lemons on hand. Remember, though, that you can freeze lemon juice if you're not able to use the lemons you have on hand. Toss the carrots and asparagus with the dressing just before serving. The acid in the lemon juice will turn the asparagus and olive green over time. I feel as though an attractive appearance is important when you're serving food. We really do eat first with our eyes. The salad is very attractive when the asparagus is bright green. Sicilian orange salad is another beautiful but simple to make side. At its best, this salad includes different colored and flavored oranges. I like to use blood, navel, and caracara oranges, but since caracaras and blood oranges are seasonal, I've also made it with just navels, and it's good. The only other ingredients are onion, olive oil, and Kalamata olives. First peel and slice the oranges. I cut off the ends, Stand the orange on one of its cut ends and slice down the orange in a curve to remove the rind and skin. Then slice the orange crosswise. 
If there are white cores in the center of slices, I pop them out, as I've done in the lower left photo. Arrange the orange slices attractively. Then very thinly slice a red onion. Be sure to taste the onion, and if it has too much bite, tame it in ice water, drain it, and dry in a paper towel. In this dish, you want the onion to provide primarily a crisp contrast. Notice I've removed the hard cores from slices. I'll put those in another dish. Chop Kalamata Olives Even if you're using pitted olives, always be on the lookout for pits. Every now and then, one will make its way into the jar. Add the olives and onions, cover with plastic wrap, and refrigerate. Just before serving, drizzle a little olive oil over the dish. It really is delicious. Spring salad with farro is another refreshing salad. I like to include two grains in this, farro and quinoa. Quinoa never has enough body on its own for me, but it beautifully carries the dressing in a salad. So I use some of it for that and then pair it with farro, an ancient grain that's larger than barley, but similar in appearance. It's quite chewy. Cooked farro is on the left and cooked tricolored quinoa is on the right. The recipe includes sugar snap peas, which you need to make sure you string. I then steam them whole, shock them in ice water, drain, and cut into thirds or so. When sugar snap peas aren't available, I've used cooked shelled garden peas for this salad. Cube cucumbers. I've used hothouse cucumbers so I can leave the skin on as they're not waxed, and have the small tomatoes. This again results in pieces that are similar in size. Dice red onion, checking to make sure it doesn't need to be tamed. Chop fresh dill. The dill's a major flavor in this salad. If you can find large bunches of pickling dill, it works fine. If you buy it in the little plastic containers, you may well need two of them to have enough. I mix the dressing in a jar. It again is simple, olive oil, red wine vinegar, and the dill. I also cube the feta cheese, which is optional. Combine the vegetables and dressing. If you're going to serve it right away, you can mix in the cheese. Otherwise, I add it at serving time. I also sometimes serve it in a separate bowl so it doesn't have to be added if people prefer not to. Our next recipe is for broccoli and lemon and red chili pepper. Another very simple recipe. First, cut, steam, and cool broccoli. To cool it quickly, I shock it in ice water. Notice I've used the florets, but also peeled and quartered the stems. They're also delicious. Saute garlic, anchovies, and red pepper flakes in olive oil. Even if you don't like whole anchovies on a pizza or a Caesar salad, I recommend you use the anchovies in this sauce. They cook down. People often say they melt. And that's kind of what it's like. You don't taste the anchovy, but there is a richness and umami in this dressing that's missing without them. Toss the broccoli with the dressing and serve. This is good warm or at room temperature. I like it best at room temperature. It's wonderful to have dishes you can make that are best served that way. It eliminates a lot of the last minute pressure when you're preparing a meal. Most foods are actually more flavorful when they are at room temperature. Our next recipe is for beans, broccoli rabe, also known as rapini, and garlic. We really like this dish a lot. The only unusual ingredient needed for this dish is the broccoli rabe. It's the vegetable on the right. As you can see, it has broccoli-like flower heads and leaves. It's in the same family, the brassica family, but it's actually a different vegetable with a distinct flavor. The broccoli rabe is easy to prepare. We use the stems, but they do need to be peeled, which can easily be done by just scraping a paring knife down the stem. The stems and leaves are then chopped, boiled in water, and cooled in an ice bath. 
If you aren't going to complete the dish when the broccoli rabe is done, be sure to refrigerate it. You don't want even vegetables to be held in the danger zone of above 40 degrees and under 140. If I'm making this dish, I will often prepare the broccoli rabe, mince the garlic, and then put the two ingredients in the refrigerator until dinner time. I often use canned beans, low sodium if possible. The only other ingredients are red pepper flakes and olive oil. It's best to assemble those non-refrigerated ingredients so you're certain not to leave one out. To complete this dish, you just saute the rabe and garlic in oil. Add the beans and hot pepper flakes and continue sautéing until all is warm. It's a very good side dish. Roasting is a great way to easily add vegetable sides to your Mediterranean-style meal. Roasting intensifies a vegetable's flavor and brings out its natural sweetness. One of our favorite roasted vegetables is cauliflower. I have begun roasting slices rather than florets. I slice off the head stem so it's level, stand the head up on that end, and then slice it in half. I then continue slicing thick slabs and lay them down on a baking sheet. I drizzle olive oil over the cauliflower and then brush or toss it to coat both sides as well as the baking sheet with oil. Sprinkle with a little kosher salt and bake at 400 degrees. I like to use kosher salt because the pieces are fluffier, which means that you can distribute it over the entire sheet without oversalting. I'm using it in my salt cellar, which lets me easily take out a pinch or two for this. The cauliflower will begin to nicely brown. That's the caramelizing that brings out additional flavor. With planks, a larger surface lays against the hot pan, which results in even more caramelization. Cauliflower roasted this way can be served as slices on a plate or cut into pieces. The attached core in planks is very edible. You just need to make sure that you roast it long enough that it's tender. A roasted vegetable like this can be served on its own, but you can also add vinaigrettes, herbs, sauces, or other Mediterranean ingredients. You can roast almost any vegetable, but there's one roasted vegetable that's used a lot in Mediterranean cooking, red bell peppers. I thought I'd provide a few details on roasting them. Bottled roasted peppers are fine, and I use them too, but freshly roasted red peppers are spectacular. It is, of course, important to start with fresh red peppers. As a pepper ages, its flesh begins to dehydrate. As it shrinks, the skin wrinkles. You want peppers that are firm with smooth, glossy skin. And peppers with thick flesh work especially well. For years, I thought you had to always roast peppers whole and then peel and remove the core and seeds after roasting, which is challenging at best. If you want to stuff a whole pepper, you will need to do that. But most of the time, I only need half peppers or strips, so I begin by cutting the raw pepper in half. Then I remove the stem, seeds, and membranes. If I'm cleaning a lot of peppers, I pull out a melon ball tool. It works great to scrape the membranes out. You can also do that with a paring knife. Red peppers can be a bit pricey. I like to purchase a lot in the summer at the farmer's market when they're in season, or in the grocery store when they're on sale. I roast a large number and freeze them. When I'm preparing vegetables, I usually position an empty bowl to the right for any peel, seeds, or scraps. It's a lot easier than making multiple trips to the compost container or garbage pail. I put the peppers cut side down on a baking sheet. If you don't need full halves and want to make them flatter for more consistent broiling, you can slit them and spread them out flatter, or you can just press down on them. I usually kept keep them full halves. You don't need to oil the sheet 
or the peppers. Broil in your oven until the tops are charred and wrinkled, but the flesh is not burned. You may need to put your oven shelf down one notch from where you usually broil. Watch carefully, especially the first time. You want to broil until you see the skin wrinkling, pulling away from the flesh. You don't want areas like that one at the end of the yellow arrow. I would return that pepper to the oven, maybe tipped up over another pepper to direct more heat on that spot. I immediately put the peppers in a large food storage container with a tight lid and let them cool until they are easy to handle. The steam will help the skin separate from the flesh. You can put them in a bowl and cover it with plastic wrap, but I really like the way a container holds all the heat in. And it's always good to add one less piece of plastic wrap to our landfills. When they're cool enough, peel each and remove the seeds. The skin should pull right off. You can scrape off any attached bits. Your container will have a somewhat oily liquid from the peppers left in the bottom. I add that to the container I'm storing my roasted peppers in, whether I'm storing them in the refrigerator or freezing them. And I should add, these peppers freeze very well. Roasted red peppers are a wonderful treat. Next, we'll make a popular meatless entree, eggplant rollatini. An elongated eggplant works best for this, as you want long slices for rolling. I remove the ends and then stand the eggplant up to slice it. I find the straightest side and take a thin slice off and set it aside. We don't want a slice covered with peel. I slice the rest of the eggplant. When you get to the last slices, you may need to lay the remaining piece flat and cut horizontally. There's no need to salt the eggplant to remove moisture for this recipe, nor do I find it necessary to salt eggplant to counteract bitterness. Today's eggplants have much less bitterness than in the past. The slices are ready for the next step. In this recipe, the eggplant is breaded with a combination of soft breadcrumbs and grated parmesan. If you have a food processor, fresh breadcrumbs are very easy to make. I remove the crust from Italian or French bread. You could also use any other bread. If you don't have a processor, the best dried substitution would be panko. I cut the bread into chunks and load it into my food processor. I process and then measure the amount needed. Breadcrumbs freeze very well, so you don't need to waste them if you make too many. I like to use grated Parmesan. As I've mentioned before, I really like to use imported Parmesan whenever possible, and freshly grate it. You can also use purchased grated Parmesan. If you do grate it, a grater like the one shown is nice. Your knuckles aren't vulnerable to grating with this type of grater. It does take a fair amount of hand strength, as you must press the top against the cheese with your thumb as you grate. Measure the cheese. I always gently pack grated or shredded cheese. Next, it's time to set up an assembly line for coating the eggplant with flour, beaten egg, and a mixture of cheese and breadcrumbs. Bread each eggplant slice by coating both sides with flour, dipping it in egg, and then coating both sides with crumbs and cheese. You don't need to fully coat the slice. You just want enough that it rests on coating on the baking sheet. Lay each coated piece on a baking sheet, sprinkle with salt and pepper, and bake at 350 degrees. The cheese and breadcrumbs will nicely brown, bringing flavor to the dish. If you're making this for a vegan or need the dish to be gluten-free, you can bake the eggplant with no coating. Just slightly brush it with oil and bake. While the eggplant is cooking and then cooling, make the rollatini filling. This is a combination of shredded mozzarella, grated Romano cheese, ricotta cheese, and chopped basil. Mix all together. Add the filling to the eggplant. I portion the filling out and then spread it over each piece. Roll each slice up, starting with the narrower end. 
Place it in your baking dish with a little sauce in the bottom. You can use purchase sauce, but I'll show you how to make the sauce I use shortly. Sometimes the roll will want to unroll. If it wants to unroll to the left, I put that side against the edge of the pan. That way it rolls into the pan edge and stays rolled. Arrange the rolled eggplant and spread sauce across the top. It's now ready for baking. I use a simple meatless tomato sauce for rollatini, lasagna, and pasta. It uses only crushed canned tomatoes, olive oil, dried basil, garlic, salt, black pepper, and a little sugar. We need an entire head of garlic for this, so I put the head on a surface, cover it with a kitchen towel to keep it from scattering, and then smack it hard with the bottom of a heavy pan. Sometimes you have to smack it several times. You want to first crack the cloves apart and then crack the skin on the individual cloves so you can easily peel them. Be ruthless because we're going to chop it up anyway so it doesn't matter if some cloves get smashed. When a full head of garlic is required, I chop it in my mini food processor. The garlic is sautéed in olive oil. Remember to start with the oil and garlic in a cold pan. I always have my opened cans of crushed tomatoes sitting beside the stove so the minute the garlic is fragrant, I can add the tomatoes and avoid burning the garlic. Canned crushed tomatoes vary a great deal. Experiment to find the brand that you enjoy most. Some are thicker than others or more sour or acidic than others. Depending on which brand you use, you may need to modify the amount of water or cooking time or the amount of sugar. I have even on occasion had to add a splash of vinegar to perk up the sauce. Simmer until it's the desired thickness. Be sure it reaches a point where it is sauce and not pieces of tomato floating in liquid. Let's look at one other Mediterranean entree, broccoli and ricotta cannelloni. This is another recipe that doesn't require a lot of special ingredients. You can buy cannelloni shells, pasta tubes, but I find it easier to use what are called oven-ready or no-boil lasagna noodles. I hydrate the noodles by placing them in a pan of warm water. When they become flexible, I remove them from the water and lay them out on a clean kitchen towel. The broccoli is steamed. When it's cool, I puree the broccoli in a food processor. This uses fresh breadcrumbs. Here I'm processing some whole wheat bread that I had on hand. If you don't have a processor or any fresh bread, you could use panko breadcrumbs. The crumbs are combined with olive oil and milk. Add the pureed broccoli, ricotta, Parmesan cheese, and ground nutmeg. Add the chopped nuts and combine. Line the bottom of the baking dish with sauce as we did for the rollatini. You could use the same sauce, but for this I often use a fresh tomato sauce. We'll look at that recipe next. I lay one of the hydrated noodles on a cutting board. Put filling across one end of the noodle and then roll it tightly. I usually stop when there's a little overlap of pasta and slice off the end, but there would be nothing wrong with continuing to roll and using the whole lasagna noodle. Place rolls in your baking dish and brush with olive oil. Sprinkle with grated cheese and bake. I serve with fresh tomato sauce on the side. I like to use fresh tomato sauce with this recipe because it's a little lighter and doesn't overwhelm the cannelloni but that's a matter of personal taste. This sauce is very simple. In the summer, I make it with whatever tomato is ripe in the garden, but much of the year, flavorful tomatoes are hard to come by. My choice in the dead of winter is always the Roma tomato, which usually has more flavor than others off season. I slice off the ends and chop them without peeling or seeding. I also often include any leftover tomatoes I have frozen. When I have a few grape tomatoes I'm afraid will spoil, I just pop them in a freezer bag and put them in the freezer, and then pull them out when I'm making a sauce. They work fine with other fresh tomatoes. If you want to peel your tomatoes, the easiest way is to drop them in boiling water for a second or two and then in an ice bath. 
As you can see, the skin begins to pull away from the meat and is easily removed. If I seed the tomato, I cut it in half crosswise and squeeze the seeds and juice into a bowl. And then I put the liquid and seeds through a sieve so I can return the juice to the sauce. The gel around the seeds is very flavorful, so I make certain to keep as much as possible in my sauce, usually by not seeding the tomatoes at all. Watch for hard cores as you're chopping your tomatoes. Some heirloom varieties, and also some commercially grown tomatoes, have these areas that should be removed as they'll not cook down well. Mince garlic. This garlic is what is known as hard neck garlic. The arrow points to the very hard neck running through it. Much of the garlic we purchase just has twisted skin to look like a neck. I try to purchase hard neck garlic whenever I can. It has large cloves that are much easier to work with, and it often has a more complex flavor. I use the garlic press at right to mince the garlic. Saute chopped onions and add the garlic, and then add the chopped tomatoes. Simmer with herbs, and then process. Here is a cannelloni served with the additional sauce and cheese. Cannelloni can be filled with many mixtures. Here I'm using some leftover rollatini filling. Cannelloni are also an excellent entree to freeze. I just put cannelloni in a freezer container, cover them with lots of sauce, and freeze. Remember that when you reheat any foods, it's critical to bring them to a safe temperature. Hummus is a great Mediterranean appetizer, or we find it makes a meal with a selection of fresh vegetables. It involves very few ingredients, chickpeas, also called garbanzo beans, olive oil, lemon, garlic, tahini, and salt. Both dried and canned beans work really well for this recipe. If I'm using dried beans, I wash them and cook them in a pressure cooker. They need to cook until they're very soft. I cook them at least 45 minutes in my pressure cooker. We want the hummus to be creamy. Next, drain the cooked chickpeas, but save the liquid. The next step is optional, but completing it makes an extraordinarily smooth hummus. The step is skinning the beans. You can do that with your fingers in a bowl of water. The bean pops right out of its skin. Many of the skins will float to the top so you can pour them off. You can pick the rest out. You'll be discarding quite a volume of skins. Many times I don't skin every bean, but I try to skin quite a few. You can skin canned beans in the same way. Again, this is totally optional. My husband thought I was crazy to even suggest it. But texture is very important to me, which is why I do it most of the times I make hummus. Next, process the beans with olive oil, bean cooking liquid if you have it, or water, and salt. Add tahini, which is a thick paste made from raw sesame seeds. This may be available in the international section of your grocery, and it's almost always available in health food stores. As you can see in the photo at left, it sometimes separates. You may need to stir to combine the oil with the solids before measuring out what you need. Next, add the lemon juice and fresh garlic. Puree again until very smooth. It may seem a little thin, but it will thicken as it's refrigerated. Hummus is low in calories and high in protein, which makes it a wonderful snack. We make a batch and eat it with various fresh vegetables and in wraps. Our last recipe is for an Italian cookie, Sicilian almond cookies. The ingredients are simple, and note that there's no wheat flour, which makes this a gluten-free recipe. If you wanted to eliminate all animal products, the egg whites could be replaced by an equal amount of aquafaba, the liquid from canned chickpeas. The recipe starts with a mixture of almond flour and sugar. If you store nuts and nut flours in the freezer like I do, you may have to use a spoon to press out lumps as the flour warms. 
In the recipe, I give the number of egg whites, but I also give a measurement because egg size can vary, and the proportion of egg whites to dry ingredients is especially important in this recipe. Any extra egg white can be used for the coating. Put the apricot preserves through a sieve to make sure it is totally smooth and to help it mix well with the batter. Beat the egg whites and then fold into the batter. The egg whites will lose their volume, but that's okay. Fold in the sieved preserves, then prepare for coating the cookies. I use a big dinner plate. Almonds are on one side and a small amount of the additional egg white, slightly beaten, is next to the almonds. I find that using a little bit of egg white at a time works best. I leave some of the area empty for putting the cookies to be coated. I spoon oval-shaped dollops of dough onto the plate. Roll the oval in egg white. I usually get about four to six ready for rolling at a time. Then roll each in sliced almonds, coating each cookie with nuts. Fill a parchment-lined baking sheet with cookies. I often make them quite small, so they're just a couple of bites. You can make them larger, too. I use restaurant-style half-sheet pans for baking and purchase pre-cut parchment sheets for them. You usually have to purchase about a hundred of these sheets at a time, but they're so much easier to use than parchment from a roll, which has to be cut and always wants to curl up. Be sure to bake them until they're nicely browned. They will almost look overbaked. What you want is a crisp exterior and chewy interior. Cool them on a baking rack. These are great for both everyday and special occasions. Meatless Mediterranean meals can be delicious, from appetizer through dessert. I hope you find some recipes and approaches you'd like to use. Following are all the recipes discussed. Remember, you can pause the video at any point to copy something down or to photograph a page. Page 1 includes basic pantry lists and the recipe for a Greek-style salad. Page 2 includes the recipes for asparagus and carrot julienne, spring salad with farro, and mustard vinaigrette dressing. Page 3 includes the recipes for eggplant rollatini and meatless tomato sauce made with canned tomatoes. Page 4 features the recipes for hummus, broccoli and lemon and red chili pepper, and Sicilian citrus salad. Page 5 includes the recipes for Sicilian almond cookies and beans, broccoli rabe, and garlic. Page 6 features the recipes for broccoli and ricotta cannelloni and the tomato sauce made with fresh tomatoes. At the bottom is a guide for adjusting the balance of taste. Thank you for watching this program. We hope you'll enjoy making meatless Mediterranean meals.